So I want to do um, two things. Uh, talk about um, talk a little bit about like some some ways to use convolutional nets in various ways, uh, which um, I haven't gone through last time. And uh, and I'll also um, talk about different types of architectures that uh, some of which are sort of relatively recent design that people have been uh, kind of playing with for, for, for quite a while. So let's see. So last time when we talked about convolutional nets, we stopped at the idea that we can use convolutional nets with kind of a sliding window over large images, and it consists in just uh, applying the convolutions on large images, uh, which is a sort of very general image, a uh, very general method. So we're going to... Uh, See a few more things on how we use how we use convolutional nets, and uh, to some extent, I'm going to rely on a bit of uh, sort of historical uh, papers and things like this to explain kind of simple forms of all of those ideas. Uh, so, uh, the, the, as I as I said last time, the <clears throat> I had this example where there's multiple characters on an image, and you can you have a convolutional net that. Uh, whose output is also a convolution, like every layer is a convolution, so you can interpret the output as basically giving you a score for every category and for every window on the input. And the, the framing of the window depends on uh, like the, the windows that uh, the system observes when you back project from a particular output, uh, kind of steps by the amount of uh, subsampling, the total amount of subsampling you have in the network. So if you have two layers that subsample by a factor of two, you have two pooling layers, for example, that subsample by a factor of two, the overall uh, subsampling ratio is four. And what that means is that every output is going to basically look at a window on the input, and successive outputs is going to look at successive windows that are separated by four pixels. Okay, It's just a product of all the subsampling layers. Um, so... This, this is nice, but then you kind of have to make sense uh, of like, all the stuff that's on the input. How, how do you pick out uh, objects, objects that uh, overlap each other, uh, etc.? And one thing you can do for this is, is called uh, non-maximum non suppression, uh, <clears throat> which is what people use in sort of object detection. So basically what that consists in is that if you have uh, outputs that kind of are more or less at the same place and or, or sort of overlapping, overlapping places. And one of them tells you, I see a, a bear, and the other one tells you, I see a horse. One of them wins. Okay, It's probably one that's wrong. And you can't have a bear and a horse at the same, t at the same place, so you do what's called non-maximum suppression. You kind of look at which, uh, which of those has the highest score, and you kind of pick that one. Or you see if any neighbors also recognize a bear or a horse, and you kind of make a... A, a vote, if you want a local vote, okay? And I'm going to go into the details of this because uh, just just kind of rough ideas. A lot of this is uh, uh, already implemented in code that you can download, and also it's kind of the topic of a, a, a full-fledged uh, uh, computer vision uh, course. Uh, so here we just allude to kind of how, how we use uh, deep learning for, for this kind of application. Um, let's see. So here's, uh, uh, again, going back to, to history a little bit, uh, some ideas of, of how you use uh, uh, neural nets to, or convolutional nets in this case, to uh, recognize strings of characters, which is kind of the same problem as recognizing multiple objects, really. So if you have, a, you have an image that uh, contains the image uh, at the top, 23206, it's a zip code, and the characters touch, so you don't know how to separate them in advance. So you just apply a, a convolutional net to the entire string, but you don't know in advance what width the characters will take. And so uh, what, you, uh, what you see here uh, are four different sets of outputs, and those four different sets of outputs of, of, the, of the convolutional net, uh, each of which has 10 rows, and the 10 rows corresponds to each of the 10 categories. Um, so if you look at the top, for example, the top, uh, the top block, the... The, uh, the, the white squares represent high-scoring categories. So what you see on the left is that the number two is being recognized. So the, the window that uh, is looked at by the output units that are on the first column is on the, on the left side of the image, and it, and it detects a two uh, because the, uh, 
you know, their order 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. So you see a white square that corresponds to the detection of a 2. And then as the window is uh, uh, shifted over the, uh, over the input, uh, there's a 3, a low scoring 3 that is seen. Then the 2 again, there's three, character, th uh, three detectors that, that see this 2. And then nothing, then the 0, and then the 6. Um, now, this first um, system looks at a fairly narrow window. And, uh, or maybe it's a wide window. No, I think it's a wide window. So it looks at a pretty wide window. And it, uh, when it looks at the, 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 two, uh, the two that's on the left, for example, it actually sees a piece of the three with it. With it. So it's kind of uh, in the window. The different sets of outputs here correspond to different size uh, of the kernel of the last layer. So the second row, the second uh, block, uh, the, the size of the kernel is 4 in the horizontal dimension. Uh, the next one is 3, and the next one is 2. What this allows the system to do is look at uh, regions of various width of the input without being kind of too confused by the characters that are on the side, if you want. So for example, the, the, uh, the second two, uh, the 0, is very high scoring on the on the uh, the second, third, and, and fourth map, but not very high scoring on the top map. Similarly, the three is kind of high scoring on the uh, second, third, and, th and fourth map, but not on the first map because the three kind of overlaps with the two, and so it wants to really look at an hour window to be able to recognize it. Okay. Yes. So it's the size of the white square that indicates the score, basically. Okay. Uh, so look at uh, you know this this column here. You have a high scoring zero uh, here because it's the first the first row corresponds to the category zero, but it's not so high scoring from the top the top one because uh, that output unit looks at a pretty wide input and it gets confused by the stuff that's on the side. Okay, so you have something like this, and now you have to make sense out of it and extract the best uh, interpretation of that of that sequence, and. It's true for zip code, but it's true for just about every piece of text. Not every combination of characters is possible. So when you read English text, there is uh, you know, an English dictionary, English grammar, and not every combination of characters is possible. So you can have a language model that uh, attempts to uh, tell you what is the most likely sequence of characters that we're looking at here, given that this is English or whatever language. Or given that this is a zip code, not every zip code are possible. Uh, so there's some possibility for error correction. So how do we take that into account? Um, I'll come to this in a second, but um, but here what, what we need to do is uh, kind of you know uh, come up with a consistent interpretation that you know there's obviously a three, there's obviously a, uh, there's obviously a two, a three, a zero somewhere, uh, another two, etc. Um, how do we turn this? Uh, array of scores into uh, into a consistent inter interpretation. It's the width of the the horizontal width of the the kernel of the last layer, okay. Which means when you back pro pro uh, back project on the input, the the viewing window on the input that influences that particular unit um, has various size depending on which unit you look at. Yes. The width of the block. Yeah. Is it just how wide the actual image is? It's uh, it it's how wide the input image is divided by four because the subsampling ratio is four, so you get one of one column of those per every four pixel. So remember, we had this uh, this way of using a, a neural net, a convolutional net, which is that you you basically make every convolution larger, and you view the last layer as a convolution as well. And now what you get is multiple outputs. Okay, so what I'm representing here on the, the slide you just uh, saw is, the, is this 2D array on the output which corresponds where, where the, the, the row corresponds to categories, okay, and each column corresponds to a different location on the input. And I showed you those uh, examples here. So here this is a different representation here where the, the character that is displayed just before the, the title bar is, you know, indicates the winning category. So I'm not displaying the scores of every category. I'm just, dis just displaying the winning category here. Uh, but each output looks at a 32 by 32 window. 
and the next output by looks at a 32 over 32 window shifted by four pixels, okay, etc. So how do you turn this, uh, you know, sequence of characters into the fact that it's either three five or five three? Okay, so here the reason why we have four of those is so that the, is because the last layer um, is different. Is different last layers, if you want. There's four la different last layers, each of which is trained to recognize the ten categories, uh, and those last layers have different uh, kernel width. So they essentially look at different width of windows on the input. So you want some that look at wide windows so they can look, they, they can recognize kind of large characters and some that look at look at narrow windows so they can recognize narrow characters without being uh, perturbed by the the neighboring characters. So if you know a priori that there are five uh, five characters here because it's a zip code, um, you can do you can use a trick and there's sort of a few specific tricks that. Uh, uh, I can explain, but I'm going to explain sort of ge the general trick, if you want. I didn't want to talk about this, actually. At least not now. Okay, here's a, here's a general trick. The general trick is, or the, the you know, kind of uh, somewhat specific trick. Oops, I don't know why I keep changing the slide. Um, <clears throat> you say, I, have, I know I have fat characters in this word. Um, is there a... Uh, a, um, so let's say I have one of those arrays that produces scores. So for each category, let's say I have four categories here, and each location, there's a score, okay? And let's say I know that I want uh, five characters out. I'm going to draw them vertically. One, two, three, four, five, because it's a zip code. So the question I'm, I'm going to ask now is, what is the best character I can put in this, and, uh, in this slot, in the first slot? And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to draw an array. And on this array, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to say, what is the score here for um, at, at every intersection in the array? It's going to be well, what is the what is the score of putting uh, a particular character here at that location, given the score that I have at the output of my neural net? Okay, so let's say that. Um, um, so what I'm going to have to decide is, uh, since I have fewer characters uh, on, the, on the output of the system, five, uh, than I have uh, viewing windows and scores produced by the, by the system, I'm going to have to figure out which one I draw. Okay? And what I can do is build this, uh, build this array. And um, what I need to do is go from here to here by finding a path through this uh, through this array. In such a way that I have exactly five uh, f um, steps, if you want. So each step corresponds to to a character. And the overall score of a particular string is the overall uh, is the sum of uh, all the scores that uh, are along this path. In other words, if I get uh, uh, three um, instances here, three locations where I have a high score for this particular category, uh, which is category one, okay, I start at zero, so one, two, three. Um, I'm going to say this is the same guy, and it's a one. And here, if I have uh, two guys that have a score for three, I'm going to say 
those are the three. And here I have only one guy that has a high score for two, so that's a two, etc. So this path here has to be sort of continuous. Um, I can't jump from one position to another because that would be kind of breaking the order of the characters. Okay. Um, and I need to find a path that goes through high scoring uh, cells, if you want, that correspond to uh, high scoring categories along this path. And it's a way of, uh, of saying, you know, if I have, uh, if, if those three cells here all give me the same character, it's only one character. I'm just going to output uh, one here that corresponds to this. Okay, those three guys have a high score. I stay on the, on the one, and then I, I transition uh, to the second character, so now I'm going to fill out this slot, and this guy has high score for three, so I'm going to put a three here, and this guy has a high score for two, that's two, etc. cetera. Um, the, the, uh, the principle to find this, uh, this path is a shortest path algorithm. You can think of this as a graph, where I can go from the lower left cell to the upper right cell by either going to the left or going uh, up and to the left. And uh, for each of those transitions, there is a, there's a cost. And for each of the, for putting a, a character at that location, there is also a cost or a, a, a score, if you want. So the overall... Uh, score of, of the one at the bottom would be the combined score of the, the three uh, locations that detect that one. And uh, because it's more, all three of them are uh, contributing evidence to the fact that there is a one. Well, you constrain the path to have five steps. Okay. It has to go from the bottom left to the top right, and it has five steps, so it has to go through five steps. There's no choice. That's, that's how you force the system to kind of give you five characters, basically, right? And because the path can only go from left to right and from top to bottom, uh, it has to give you the characters in the order in which they appear in the image. So it's a way of imposing the order of the character and imposing that there are fives, that there are five characters in the string. Yes. You have to, okay. In the back, yes. You, right. Yes. Well, so if you have uh, just a string of one, you have to have uh, trained a system in advance so that when it's in between two ones or two characters, whatever they are, it, it, it says nothing. It says none of the above. Uh, otherwise, you can tell, right? Yeah, a system like this uh, needs to be able to tell you this is none of the above. It's not a character. It's a piece of it. Or I'm in the middle of two characters. Or I have two characters on the side, but nothing in the middle. Yeah, absolutely. It's a form of non-maximum suppression. So you can think of this as kind of a smart form of non-maximum suppression, where you say, like, for every location, you can only have one character. Uh, and the order in which you produce the five characters uh, must correspond to the order in which they appear on the image. What you don't know is how to warp one into the other. Okay? So how to kind of, you know, how many detectors are going to see the number two? It may be three of them, and we're going to decide they're all the same. So the thing is, uh, for all of you who learn computer science, uh, which is not everyone, the, the way you compute this path is just a shortest path algorithm. You do this with uh, dynamic programming. OK? So find the shortest path to go from bottom left to top right by, going through, by only, going to, only taking transition to the right uh, or diagonally, and by minimizing the the cost, so if you, you think each of those uh, is, is, is filled by a cost or maximizing the score, if, if you think there are scores, there are probabilities, for example. And it's just a shortest path algorithm in a graph. Uh, this kind of method, by the way, was uh, 
Some of the early methods of speech recognition kind of work this way. Not with neural nets, though. With sort of hand-extracted features from... Uh, but they would basically match the, the sequence of vectors extracted from a speech signal to a template of a word. And then, you know, try to see how you warp the time to uh, match the, the, the word to be recognized to, to the templates. And you had a template for every word of a fixed size. Uh, this was called DTW, dynamic time warping. And there's a more sophisticated version of it called hidden Markov models, but it's very similar. People still do this to some extent. Okay, um, so detection. Um, so if you want to apply a convolutional net for detection, uh, it works uh, amazingly well, and it's surprisingly simple. What you, you know, what you need to do. You basically need to, let's say you want to do phase detection, which is a very easy problem. One of the first problems that computer vision started solving really well for kind of recognition. You collect a data set of uh, images with faces and images without faces. And you train a convolutional net with, with input window is something like 20 by 20 or 30 by 30 pixels to tell you whether there's a face in it or not. Okay. Now you take this uh, convolutional net, you apply it on an image, and if there is a face that happens to be roughly 30 by 30 pixels, the, the convolutional net will, will light up at the corresponding output and not light up when there is no face. Now, there's two problems with this. The first problem is uh, there is many, many ways uh, a patch of an image can be a non-face. And during your training, you probably haven't seen all of them. You haven't seen even a representative set of them. So your system is going to have lots of false positives. Uh, that's the first problem. Second problem is, uh, in a picture, not all faces are 30 by 30 pixels. So how do you handle uh, size variation? So one way to handle size variation, which is very simple, but it's mostly unnecessary in uh, modern versions, but uh, well, at least not completely necessary, is you do a multi-scale approach. So you take your image, you run your detector on it, it fires whenever it wants, uh, and it will detect faces that are small. Then you reduce the image by some scale. In this, case, in this case here, I think a square root of two. You apply the convolutional net again on that small image, and now it's going to be able to detect faces that, are, uh, that were larger in the original image, because now what was 30 by 30 pixels is now about 20 by 20 pixels, roughly. OK? Um, but there may be bigger faces there, so you scale the image again by a factor of square root of two, so now the image is half the size of the original one, and you run the convolutional net again, and now it's going to detect faces that were 60 by 60 pixels uh, in the original image, but are now 30 by 30 because you reduce the size by, by half. Uh, you might think that this is expensive, but it's not. The uh, expense uh, is half of the expense is the finer scale, the sum of the expense of the other networks are combined is about the same as the finest scale. It's because the, the, the size of the network is, you know, kind of the square of the, the size of the image on one side. And so when you scale down the image by a square root of two, the network you have to run is smaller by a factor of two. Okay? So the overall cost of this is one plus one half plus one quarter plus one eighth plus one sixteen, et cetera which is two. You waste a factor of two by doing multi-scale, which is very small. Okay, you can afford a factor of two. Um, so this is a completely ancient phase detection system um, from the early 90s. And the, the maps that you see here are kind of uh, maps that indicate kind of scores of phase detectors. The phase detector here, I think, is uh, 20 by 20 pixels, so it's very low res. And it's a big mess at the fine scales. You see kind of high scoring areas, but it's not really very definite. But you see kind of more, uh, more definite uh, uh, things down here. So here you see a, a white blob here, white blob here, white blob here. Same here, you can see a white blob here, white blob here. And those are faces. So those are, and so that's now how you, you need to do maximum suppression to get those uh, little red squares that are kind of the winning categories if you want the winning locations where you have a face. So uh, 
normal serum suppression in this case means um, I have a high scoring white, white blob here. That means there is probably a face underneath, uh, which is roughly 20 by 20. If there is another face within a window of 20 by 20, that means one of those two is wrong. So I'm just going to take the highest scoring one within the window of 20 by 20 and suppress all the others. I'm going to suppress the others at that location, at that scale. I mean, at nearby location at that scale, but also at other scales. Okay, so you you, you pick the highest scoring uh, blob, if you want, uh, uh, for every location, every scale. And whenever you pick one, you you suppress the other ones that could be conflicting with it, either because they are at different scale, the same place, or uh, at the same scale, but you know nearby. Okay, so that's the that's the first problem, and the second problem is the fact that, as I said, uh, there's many ways to be different from a face, and most likely your training set doesn't have all the non-faces things that look like faces. So the way uh, people deal with this is that they do what's called negative mining. So you go through a large collection of images where you know for a fact that there is no face, and you run your detector, and you keep all the uh, patches where your detector fires, uh, you verify that there is no faces in them, and if, the, if there is no face, you add them to your negative set. Okay? Then you retrain your detector, and then you use your retrain detector to do the same. Go again through a large data set of images where there, you know there is no face, and whenever your detector fires, add that as a negative sample. Uh, you do this four or five times, and in the end, you have a, a very robust uh, face detector that uh, it does not fall victim to negative samples. There's a lot of things that look like faces in natural images that are not faces. Uh, this works really well. Uh, this is over 15 years old uh, work. Um, this is my grandparents' marriage, by the way. Wedding. Their wedding. Um, okay. Um, so here's a, another interesting use of uh, convolutional nets, and this is for uh, semantic segmentation, what's called semantic segmentation. I alluded to this in the first, the first lecture. Um, so what is semantic segmentation? It's the problem of assigning a category to every pixel in an image, and every pixel would be labeled with a category of the object it belongs to. So you can imagine this would be very useful if you want to, uh, say, drive a robot in nature. So this is a, a robotics project that uh, I worked on, my student and I worked on a long time ago. Uh, and what you'd like is to label the image so that regions that the robot can drive on uh, are indicated and uh, areas that are obstacles are also indicated so the robot doesn't drive there. Okay, so here... Uh, the green areas are things that the robot can drive on, and the red areas are obstacles, like tall grass in that case. Um, <clears throat> so the way you, uh, you train a, a convolutional net to do, uh, to do this kind of semantic segmentation is very similar to what I just, uh, I just described. You, you take a patch from the image. Uh, in this case, I think the patches were 20 by 40 or something like that, relatively small. Uh, for which you know what the central pixel uh, is, whether it's traversable or not, whether it's green or, or red. Okay? Either it's been manually labeled or the label has been obtained in some way. And you run the convnet on this patch and you train it, you know, tell me if it's, uh, if it's green or red. Tell me if it's drivable area or not. And once the system is trained, you apply it on the entire image and it, you know, it, it puts green or red depending on where it is. In this particular case, actually, there were five categories. There was the super green, green, purple, which is the foot of an object, uh, red, which is an obstacle that you know chew off, and super red, which is like a definite obstacle. Uh, but here, we're only showing three, uh, uh, three colors. Now, in this particular uh, uh, project, the, uh, the labels were actually collected automatically. You didn't have to manually uh, label the images and the patches. What we would do would be to run the robot around and then uh, through stereo vision figure out if uh, a pixel is a, 
correspond to an object that sticks out of the ground or is on the ground. Uh, so the, the middle column here, it says stereo labels. These are uh, labels, so the color green or red is, is computed from stereo vision, from basically 3D reconstruction. Okay, so for, you have two cameras, and the two cameras can estimate the distance of every pixel by basically comparing patches. It's relatively expensive, but it kind of works. It's not completely reliable, but it sort of works. Uh, so now for every pixel, you have a depth, a distance from the camera, which means you know the position of that pixel in 3D, which means you know if it sticks out, out of the ground or if it's on the ground, because you can fit a plane to the ground. Okay, so the green pixels are the ones that are basically near, near the ground, and the red ones are the ones that are up. So now you have labels. You can train a convolutional net to predict those labels. Then you will tell me why would you want to train a convolutional net to do this if you can do this from stereo? And the answer is stereo only works up to 10 meters, roughly. Uh, past 10 meters, you can't really, using binocular vision and stereo vision, you can't really estimate the distance very well. And so that only works up to about 10 meters, and driving a robot by only looking 10 meters uh, ahead of you is not a good idea. Uh, it's like driving a car in the fog, right? It's gonna, it's not very efficient. So what you use the convolutional net for is to label every pixel in the image up to the horizon, essentially. Okay, so the, the cool thing about, about this, uh, this system is that, uh, as I said, the labels were collected automatically, but also uh, the robot adapted itself as it run. Because it collects those stereo labels constantly, it can constantly retrain its neural net to adapt to the environment it's in. In this particular instance of, the, of this robot, uh, it would only, we would only retrain the last layer. So the, the n minus one layers of the convnet were fixed, were trained in the, in the lab. And then the last layer was kind of uh, adapted as the robot uh, run. It allowed the robot to deal with environments it'd never seen before, essentially. They still have long range vision. Um, the input to the, the convnet were basically multi-scale views of sort of bands of the image around the horizon. Uh, no need to go into details. It's a, a very small neural net by today's standard, but that's what we could afford. I might have a video. I'm not sure it's going to work, but I'll try. Oh, yeah, it works. It's amazing. Um, so I should tell you a little bit about the caster character here, characters here. So... Um, Uh, you don't want the audio. <laughs> so Pierre Semenet and Raya Hetzels were, Raya Hetzel were two students uh, working with me on this project, uh, two PhD students. Pierre Semenet is at Google Brain. He works on robotics. And Raya Hetzel is director of robotics at uh, DeepMind. Marcus Coffier is at NVIDIA. Meg Rimes is at DeepMind. Jan Ben is at Mobileye, which is now Intel. Arshi Arkan is at uh, Twitter. And Urs Müller is still working with us. He's uh, actually head of a big group that works on autonomous driving at NVIDIA, and he, he's collaborating with us. Uh, actually, um, Alfredo works uh, on this project. So this is a robot, and it can drive at about uh, you know sort of fast walking speed, uh, and it's supposed to drive itself in sort of nature. Um, so it's got this mask with four eyes. There are two stereo pairs, two, two stereo camera pairs. And it has uh, three computers uh, in the belly. So it's completely autonomous. It doesn't talk to the network or anything. Um, and those, those three computers, uh, I'm on the left. That's when I had a ponytail. Um, Okay, so here the, the system is, the, the, the neural net is crippled, so the, we, di we didn't turn on the neural net, it's only using stereo vision, and now it's using the neural net. So it's, it's pretty far away from this bar barrier, but it sees it, and so it directly goes uh, to the side. It wants to go to a goal, a GPS coordinate that's behind it. Same here, it wants to go to a GPS coordinate behind it, and it, it sees right away that there is this row of people that it can go through. Uh, the guy on the right here is Marcus Coffier, he's holding a transmitter, he's not driving the robot, but he's holding the kill switch. Um, and so 
you know, that's what the, the, the convolutional net looks like. Uh, re really small by today's standard. And, and it produces for every, uh, every location, every patch on the input, uh, the second last layer is a 100-dimensional 100, 100 vector that goes into a classifier that classifies into five categories. So once the system classifies into those five categories in the image, you can, you can warp the image into a map that's centered on the robot, and you can, you can do planning in this map to figure out like, how to avoid obstacles and stuff like that. So this is what this thing does. It's a particular map called a hyperbolic map, but uh, it's not important uh, for now. Now, that, uh, because this was you know, 2007, the computers were slow, there were no GPUs, so we could run this, uh, we could run this neural net only at about one frame per second. As you can see here, the, at the bottom, it updates about one frame per second. And so if you have someone kind of walking in front of the robot, the robot won't see it for a second and will, you know, run over him. So that's why we have a, a second vision system here at the top. This one is stereo. It doesn't use uh, a neural net. Um, odometry, I think we don't care. This is the controller, which is also learned, but we don't care. And this is the, uh, the system. Here, again, its vision is crippled. It can only see up to 2.25 meters, so it's very short. But it kind of does a decent job. And this is to test this sort of fast-reacting vision system. So here, Pierre Somane is jumping in front of it, and the robot stops right away. So that, that, that's the full system with long-range vision and annoying grad students. Right, so it's kind of giving up. <laughs> okay. Oops. Okay, so that's called semantic segmentation, but the real form of semantic segmentation is one in which you, you, you give a, an object category for every location. So that's the, the kind of problem here we're talking about, where uh, every pixel is either a building or a sky or street or a car or something like this. Uh, and around 2010, uh, a couple of data sets started appearing with a few thousand images where you could train vision systems to do this. Um, and so the technique here is uh, uh, essentially identical to the, to the one I, I, I described. It's uh, also multi-scale. Uh, so you, you basically have uh, a, an input image, you have a convolutional net uh, that has uh, a set of outputs uh, that, you know, one for each category of objects for which you have label, which in this case is 33. And when you back project one output of the convolutional net onto the input, it corresponds to an input window of 46 by 46 window. So it's using a context of 46 by 46 uh, pixels to make the decision about a single pixel. At least that's the... the the neural net at the, at the bottom. But it turns out 46 by 46 is not enough if you want to decide what a gray pixel is. Is it the shirt of the person? Is it the street? Is it the, uh, a cloud or kind of a pixel on the mountain? You have to look at a wider uh, context to be able to make that decision. So uh, we use again this kind of multi-scale approach where the, the same image is uh, reduced by a factor of two and a factor of four. And you run those two, those, those two extra images to the same convolutional net, same weight, same kernel, same everything. Except the, the last feature map, you upscale them so that they have the same size as the original one. And now you take those combined feature maps and send them to uh, a couple layers of a classifier. So now the classifier, to make its decision, has four 46 by 46 windows on images of, that have been rescaled. And so the effective uh, size of the context now is, uh, is 184 by 184 window because uh, the, the, the core scale uh, network basically looks at more or less the entire uh, uh, image. Um, then you can clean it up in various ways. I'm not going to go into details of this, but uh, it works quite well. So this is the result. The guy who did this in my lab is Clément Farabé. He's a VP at NVIDIA now in charge of uh, all of machine learning infrastructure and autonomous driving, uh, not surprisingly. Um, 
and uh, and so that system, you know, this is uh, this is Washington Square Park, by the way. So this is the NYU campus. Uh, it's not perfect. Far from that. From that, you know, it, it it identifies some areas of the street as sand or desert, and there is no beach I'm aware of in Washington Square Park. Um, and, uh, but you know, it worked at the time. This was the kind of best system of its kind, and the, the number of training samples for this was very small. So it was kind of, it was about two thousand or three thousand images, something like that. You know, run you you take the you take the full resolution image. Uh, you run it to the first n minus two layers of your of your convnet. That gives you a bunch of feature maps. Then you reduce the image by a factor of two, run it again, you get a bunch of feature maps that are smaller. Then run it again by reducing by a factor of four, you get smaller feature maps. Now you take the small feature map and you rescale it, you upsample it so it's the same size as the first one, same for the second one. And you stack all those feature maps together. Okay? And that you, end, you feed to two layers for um, a classifier for every patch. Uh, yeah, the paper was rejected from CVPR 2012, even though the results were record-breaking, and it was faster than the best competing uh, method by a factor of 50, uh, even running on standard hardware, but we also had implementation on special hardware that was incredibly fast. And uh, people didn't know what a convolutional net was at the time. And so the reviewers basically could not fathom that a method they never heard of could work so well. They say it's probably wrong. There's way more to say about convnets, but I encourage you to take a computer vision course for to hear about this. Yeah, this is this is okay. This data set, this particular data set that we use, uh, is a collection of images, uh, street images. Um, that was collected mostly by Antonio Toralba at MIT, and uh, uh, he had a, a sort of a, a tool for kind of labeling. So you could you know you could sort of draw the contour of every object and then label every object and sort of it would kind of you know fill up the object. Most of the segmentations were done by his mother uh, who's in Spain. She had a lot of time to to spend doing this. Huh? His mother, yeah, labeled that stuff. Yeah, this was in the late, late 2000. Um, okay. Now let's talk about uh, a bunch of different architectures, right? So, um, you know, as, as, as I mentioned uh, before, the idea of deep learning is that you have this catalog of modules that you can assemble in sort of different graphs, and and you know to get them to do different functions, and uh, and a lot of the expertise in deep learning is to design those architectures to do something in particular. It's a little bit like you know in the early days of uh, computer science. Uh, Coming up with an algorithm to write a program was kind of a new concept. You know, reducing uh, a, a problem to kind of a, a set of instructions that, that could be run on a computer was kind of something new. And here it's the same problem. You have to sort of imagine how to reduce a complex function into sort of a, a, a graph, possibly dynamic graph, of functional modules that you don't need to know completely the function of, but that you're going to, whose function is going to be finalized by learning. But the architecture is super important, of course, as we saw with convolutional nets. The first uh, important category is recurrent nets. So uh, we've, uh, we've seen when we talked about, the, about backpropagation, there was a big uh, condition. The condition was that the graph of interconnection of the module uh, could not have loops. Okay? It had to be uh, a, uh, a graph for which there is sort of at least a partial order of the module so that you can compute the... The, the modules in such a way that when you compute the output of a module, all of its inputs are available. But a recurrent net is one in which you have loops. Uh, how do you deal with this? So here is an example of a recurrent net architecture where you have an input which varies over time, x of t, that goes through the first neural net, let's call it an encoder, um, that produces a representation of the, of the input, let's call it h of t, and it goes into a recurrent layer, and this recurrent layer is a function g that depends on trainable parameters w. There's trainable parameters also for the encoder, but I didn't mention it. And that uh, recurrent layer takes into account h of t, which is the representation of the input, but it also takes into account z of t minus 1, which is the 
sort of a hidden state, which is its output at the previous time step, its own output at the previous time step. Okay? This G function can be a very complicated neural net inside, convolutional net, whatever. It could be as complicated as you want. But what's important is that one of its inputs is uh, its output at the previous time step. Okay? Z of t minus 1. So that's what this delay indicates here. Uh, the input of, of G at time t is actually Z of t minus 1, which is the output, its output at the previous time step. Okay, then the output of that recurrent module goes into a, a decoder, which basically produces an output. Okay, so it turns the hidden representation Z into an output. Um, so how do you deal with this? You unroll the loop. So this is basically the same diagram, but now I've unrolled it in time. Okay, so I time, I time zero, I have X of zero, that goes through the encoder, it produces H of zero, and then I apply the G function, I start with a, a Z, a arbitrary Z, maybe zero or something, um, and I apply the function, and I get Z of zero, and that goes into the decoder, produces an output, okay? And then, uh, now that I have Z zero, at time step one, I can use Z zero, as the previous output for the time step, okay? Uh, now the output is x of one and time one, I run through the encoder, I run through the recurrent layer, which is now no longer recurrent, uh, and run through the decoder, and then the next time step, etc. Okay? This network that's unrolled in time doesn't have any loops anymore. Which means I can run backprop through it. So if I have an objective function that says the last output should be a particular one, or maybe the trajectory should be a particular one of the outputs, I can just backpropagate gradient through this thing. It's a regular network with one uh, particular characteristic, which is that every block shares the, share the same weights. Okay? So the three instances of the encoder they are the same encoder at two different time steps, three different time steps, so they have the same weights. The same G functions have the same weights, the, the three decoders have the same weights. Yes? Does this require that you know how big T is at the beginning of the train? It can be variable. You don't have to decide in advance. Uh, but it depends on the length of your input sequence, basically. Right? And you know, it's, you, can, you can run it for as long as you want. You don't. It's the same weights all over, so you can just you know, repeat the operation. Okay? Uh, this technique of unrolling and then backpropagating through time, basically, is called, surprisingly, BPTT, backprop through time. Uh, it's pretty obvious. That's all there is to it. Um, unfortunately, they don't work very well. At least not in their naive form. So, in the naive form, uh, so a simple form of uh, recurrent net is one in which the encoder is linear, the G function is linear with hyperbolic tangent or sigmoid or perhaps ReLU, uh, and the decoder also is linear, something like this, maybe with a ReLU or, or something like that, right? So it could be very simple. And you get a number of problems with this. And one problem is uh, the so-called vanishing gradient problem or exploding gradient problem. And it comes from the fact that if you have a long sequence, let's say, I don't know, 50 time steps, every time you backpropagate gradients, the gradients get multiplied by the weight matrix of the, the G function, okay? At every time step, the gradients get multiplied by the, the weight matrix. Now imagine the weight matrix has small values in it. Which means, that means that every time you, you take your gradient, you multiply by the transpose of this matrix to get the gradient at the previous time step, you get a shorter vector, you get a smaller vector. And you keep going, the, the vector gets shorter and shorter exponentially. That's called the vanishing gradient problem. By the time you get to the 50th uh, uh, time steps, which is really the first time step, you don't get any gradient. Um, conversely, if the weight matrix is really large and the nonlinearity in your recurrent uh, layer is not saturating, uh, your gradients can explode. Uh, the, if the weight matrix is large, every time you multiply the gradient by the transpose of the matrix, the vector gets larger and it explodes, which means uh, 
your weights are going to diverge when you do a gradient step, or you're going to have to use a tiny learning rate for it to work. Um, so you have to use a lot of tricks to make those things work. Here's another problem. The reason why you would want to use a recurrent net, why would you want to use a recurrent net? The purported advantage of recurrent net is that they can remember, th remember things from far away in the past. Okay? Uh, if, for example, you the, imagine that the, the x's are, are characters that you enter one by one, the characters that come from, I don't know, uh, a C program or something like that, right? Uh, and what your system is supposed to tell you at the end, you know, it reads a few hundred characters corresponding to the source code of a function. And at the end, it's, um, you want to train your system so that it produces one if uh, it's a syntactically correct program and minus one if it's not, okay? Hypothetical problem. Recurrent nets won't do it, okay? At least not without tricks. Now, there is a thing here which is a big issue, which is that, um, among other things, this program has to have balanced uh, braces and parentheses. So it has to have a way of remembering how many open parentheses there, there are so that it can check that you're closing them all, or how many open braces there are so, so all of them get, uh, uh, get closed, right? So it has to store, eventually, you know, uh, essentially within its hidden state Z, it has to store like how many braces and, and parentheses were open if it wants to be able to tell at the end that all of them have been closed. So it has to have some sort of counter inside, right? You're gonna see this tomorrow, yes. It's going to be a topic tomorrow. Um, now, if the program is very long, that means, you know, Z has to kind of preserve information for a long time. And recurrent net, you know, will give you the hope that maybe a system like this can do this. But because of the vanishing gradient problem, they actually don't at least not simple uh, uh, recurrent nets of the type I just described. So you have to use a bunch of tricks. Those are tricks from, you know, Yosha Vengeo's lab, but there is a bunch of them that were published by various people, uh, like Tomasz Shmikolov and various other people. Um, so to avoid exploding gradients, you can creep the gradients, just, you know, make, you know, if the gradients get too large, you just kind of squash them down, just normalize them. Uh, Leaky integration momentum, I'm not going to mention that. Uh, a good initialization, so you want to initialize the weight matrices so that they preserve the norm, more or less. Um, there's actually a whole bunch of papers on this, on orthogonal neural nets and invertible uh, recurrent nets. Um, <clears throat> but the big trick is uh, LSTM and GRUs. Okay, so what is that? Before I talk about that, I'm going to talk about multiplicative modules. So what are multiplicative modules? Uh, they're basically uh, modules in which you, you kind of multiply things with each other. So instead of just computing a weighted sum of inputs, you compute products of inputs and then weighted sum of that, okay? So you have an example of this on the top left, uh, on the top. So the output of a system here is just a weighted sum of uh, uh, weights and inputs, okay, classic. But the weights actually themselves are weighted sums of weights and inputs, okay? So WIJ here, which is the IJ term in the weight matrix of the, of the module we're considering, is actually itself uh, a weighted sum of uh, a, th a third-order tensor UIJK weighted by variable ZKs, okay? So basically what you get is that WIJ is kind of a weighted sum of uh, matrices um, UK weighted by coefficient ZK. And the ZKs can change. They are input variables the same way. So in effect, it's like having uh, a neural net uh, with weight matrix W whose weight matrix is computed itself by another neural net. There's a general form of this where you don't just multiply matrices, but you have a neural net that is some complex function, turn, turns X into, into S, um, some generic function, okay? It could be a net, whatever. And the weights of those neural nets 
are not variables that you learn directly, but they are the output of another neural net that takes maybe another input into account or maybe the same input. Some people call those architectures hypernetworks. Okay, there are networks whose weights are computed by another network. But here's just a simple form of it, which is kind of a bilinear form or quadratic uh, form. Okay, so overall, when you kind of write it all down, SI is equal to sum over J and K of uh, UIJK, ZK, XJ. So this is a double sum. People used to call this sigma pi units. Yes? What's the motivation for building something like this? Um, we'll come to this in just a second. <laughs> Basically, uh, if you want a neural net that can perform a transformation from uh, of, of a vector into another, and that transformation needs to be programmable, right? You, you can have the transformation be computed by a neural net, but the weight of that neural net would be it themselves the output of a, another neural net that figures out what the transformation is. Uh, that's kind of the more general uh, form. More specifically, uh, it's very useful if you want to route uh, uh, signals through a neural net in different ways on a data-dependent way. So, um, you, uh, in fact, that's exactly what uh, is mentioned just below. So, an attention module is a special case of this. Uh, it's not a quadratic layer; it's kind of a different type, but it's uh, a particular type of uh, of uh, architecture that uh, basically computes uh, a convex linear combination of a bunch of vectors. So x1 and x2 here are vectors. Uh, w1 and w2 are scalars, basically. Okay. And what the system computes here is a weighted sum of x1 and x2 weighted by w1, w2. And again, w1, w2 are scalars. In this case, you get the sum at the output. So imagine that those two weights, W1, W2, are between 0 and 1 and sum to 1. That's what's called a convex uh, linear combination. Uh, so you can, by, by changing W1, W2, so essentially, um, if they sum to 1, they're, they're the output of a softmax, which means W2 is equal to 1 minus W1, right? That's kind of the direct consequence. So basically, by changing uh, the relative uh, size of W1, W2, you kind of switch the output to being either X1 or X2 or some linear combination of the two, some interpolation between the two. Okay? You can have more than just X1 and X2. You can have a whole bunch of uh, Xs, X vectors. Uh, and uh, that uh, system will basically choose an appropriate linear combination or focus it's called an attention mechanism because it allows the neural net to basically focus its attention on a particular input and ignoring, ignoring the others. And the choice of this is made by another variable z, which itself could be the output of some other neural net that looks at x's, for example. Okay? And this has become a hugely important type of function. It's used in a lot of different situations now. Uh, in particular, it's used in LSTM and GRU, but it's also used in... Uh, 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 pretty much every natural language processing system nowadays that use uh, uh, either transformer architectures or other types of attention, they all use this kind of uh, this kind of trick. Okay, so you have a vector z, pass it to a softmax, you get a bunch of numbers between zero and one that sum to one. Use those as coefficient to compute a weighted sum of a bunch of vectors x. X size, and you get the weighted sum uh, weighted by those coefficients. But those coefficients are data dependent because Z is data dependent. All right, so uh, here's an example of how you use this. Whenever you have this symbol here, uh, this uh, circle with the dot in the middle, that's a component-by-component uh, component multiplication of two vectors. Some people call this Hadamard product. Um, anyway, it's turn by turn multiplication. So this is uh, a, uh, a type of a kind of functional module 
uh, GRU, Gated Recurrent Nets, that was proposed by Kung Yun Cho, who is a professor here. Um, and it attempts, it's an attempt at fixing the problem that naturally occur in recurrent nets that I mentioned, the fact that you have exploding gradient, the fact that the recurrent nets don't really remember their states for very long. They tend to kind of forget very quickly. And so it's basically a memory cell, okay? And I have to say, uh, this is the kind of second big family of sort of uh, recurrent net with memory. The first one is LSTM, but I'm going to talk about it just afterwards just because this one is a little simpler. Uh, the equations are, are written at the bottom here. So uh, basically there is uh, a, um, a gating vector, Z, which is uh, simply the application of a nonlinear uh, function, a, a sigmoid function, uh, to uh, uh, two linear layers and a bias. And those two linear layers take into account the input, X of T, and the previous state, which uh, they denote H in their case, not Z, like I did. Okay, so you take X, you take H, you compute, you pass them through matrices, uh, you pass the result, you add the results, you pass them through sigmoid functions, and you get a bunch of values between 0 and 1 because the sigmoid is between 0 and 1. Gives you a coefficient. And you use those coefficients um, you see the formula at the bottom. The Z is used to basically compute a linear combination of two inputs. If Z is equal to 1, uh, you basically only look at uh, HT minus 1. If Z is equal to 0, then 1 minus Z is equal to 1. Then you, you look at this uh, expression here. And that expression is you know, some weight matrix multiplied by the input passed through a hyperbolic tangent function. Could be a value, but it's a hyperbolic tangent in this case. And then it's combined with other stuff here that we can ignore for now. Okay, so basically what, what the Z value does is that it tells the system, just copy, if Z equal 1, it just copies its previous state and ignores the input. Okay, so it acts like a memory, essentially. It just copies its previous state on its output. And if Z equal, uh, equal 0, then the current state is forgotten, essentially, and is uh, basically you, you just read the input. Okay? Multiply by some matrix. So it changed the, changes the state of the system. Sorry, could you just clarify what 1 minus ZT actually means? Z is a vector, right? So yeah, so you do this component by component, essentially. Okay, so okay. 1 is essentially a vector of all 1. Vector 1, yeah, exactly. How will the derivatives look in case of element-wise multiplication? Will the derivatives will also get like element-wise multiplication back row? Well, it's just like a number of independent multiplications, right? What is the derivative of some objective formula with respect to the input of a product? It's equal to the derivative of that objective function with respect to the app to the product multiplied by the other term. That's as simple as that. So it's because by default, essentially, unless Z is, uh, you know, Z is more or less by default equal to 1. And so by default, the, the system just copies its previous state. Uh, and if it's just, you know, slightly less than 1, it... Uh, it puts a little bit of the input into the state, but doesn't significantly change the state. And what that means is that it uh, kind of preserves uh, norm and it preserves information. Right? So it's basically a memory cell that you can change continuously. Is there any reason why sigmoid is used in CT and RT? Well, because you need something between 0 and 1. It's a coefficient, right? And so it needs to be between 0 and 1. That's why people use sigmoids. But there's a lot of activation functions between 0 and 1, right? Uh, I mean, you need one that, that is monotonic, that goes between 0 and 1, and is monotonic and differentiable. I mean, there's lots of, fu there's lots of sigmoid functions, but, you know, why not? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's some argument for using others, but, you know, it doesn't make a huge uh, amount of difference. Okay, in the full form of GRU, there's also a reset gate. So the reset gate is uh, 
is this guy here. So R is uh, another vector that's computed also as a linear combination of inputs and, and previous state. And it, it serves to multiply the previous state. So uh, if R is 0, then the previous state is, uh, if R is 0 and Z is uh, 1, uh, the system is basically completely reset to, uh, to 0 because that is 0. And so it only looks at the input. But that's basically a, a simplified version of uh, something that came out way earlier in 1997 uh, called LSTM, Long Short Term Memory, uh, which you know attempted was, was an attempt at solving the same issue that you know recurrent nets basically lose memory for too long, and so you build them as um, as memory cells by default, and by default they will preserve the information. It's essentially the same idea here. It's a, you know the details are slightly different. Here they don't have dots in the middle of the round shape here for the product, but it's the same thing. Uh, and there's you know, a little more kind of moving parts. It's uh, basically, it looks more like a, an actual RAN cell. So it's like a flip-flop that can you know, preserve information and there is some leakage that you can have. You can reset it to zero or to one. Uh, it's very complicated. Um, thankfully, uh, people at NVIDIA, Facebook, Google, and various other places have very efficient implementations of those, so you don't need to figure out how to write the CUDA code for this or write the backprop. Um, works really well. Uh, it's, it's quite widely used, but it's used less and less because people use recurrent nets. People used to use recurrent nets for natural language processing, mostly, and things like speech recognition. And speech recognition is moving towards using convolutional nets. Uh, temporal convolutional nets, why, uh, while uh, natural language processing is moving towards using what's called transformers, which we'll hear a lot about tomorrow, right? No? When? <laughs> Two weeks from now, okay. Um, so transformers are, um, okay, I'm not going to talk about transformers just now. But uh, basically transformers are kind of a, a, a generalization sort of general use of attention, if you want. It's a, a, a big neural nets that use attention, that, you know, every block of neuron uses attention. And that tends to work really well. It works so well that people are kind of basically dropping everything else for NLP. So the problem is uh, systems like LSTM are not very good at this. So uh, transformers are much better. The biggest transformers have billions of parameters. Uh, like the biggest one is what, 15 billion, something like that? that order of magnitude, the T5 or whatever it's called, um, from Google. So um, that's an enormous amount of, uh, of memory, and it's uh, because of the particular type of architecture that's used in transformers, they, they can actually store a lot of knowledge, if you want. Um, so that's the stuff people would use for, for, for what, you, what you're talking about, like question answering systems, translation systems, etc. They will use transformers. Um, uh, let me, okay. So because LSTM kind of was sort of, you know, one of the first architectures, recurrent architecture that kind of worked, uh, people tried to use them for things that at first you would think are crazy but turned out to work. Uh, and one example of this is uh, translation. Neural, uh, it's called neural machine translation. Uh, so there was a paper uh, by Ilya Sutskever at NIPS 2014 where he, he trained this giant multilayer LSTM. So what's a multilayer LSTM? It's an LSTM where you have, uh, so this is the unfolded version, right? So at the bottom here you have an LSTM, which is here unfolded for three time steps, but it will have to be unfolded for the length of a sentence you want to translate. It's a sentence in French. Um, and, um, and then you take the hidden state at every time step of this LSTM, and you feed that as input to a second LSTM. And I think in his network, he actually had four layers of that. So you can think of this as kind of stacked LSTM that, you know, are, each of them are recurrent in time, but they are kind of stacked as, as the layers of a neural net. So at the last time step and the last layer, you have a vector here, which is meant to represent the entire meaning of that sentence. Okay? So it could be a fairly large vector. And then you feed that to another multilayer LSTM. LSTM, which um, you know you run for a, a sort of undetermined number of steps, and the role of this LSTM is to produce words in a target language. If you do translation, say German, 
Okay, so this system, you know, it takes the, the state, you run through the first two layers of the LSTM, produce a word, and then take that word and feed it as input to the next time step so that you can generate text sequentially, right? Run through this, produce another word, take that word, feed it back to the input, and just keep going. So this is a, if you do this for translation, you get this gigantic uh, neural net, you train it, and this is the, it's a system of this type, the one that ESSK represented at NIPS in 2014. It was the first neural translation system that had performance that could rival sort of more classical approaches, not based on neural nets. And people were really surprised that you could get such results. Um, that success was very short-lived. Yeah, so the problem is um, the word you're going to say at a particular time depends on the word you just said, right? And if you ask the system to just produce a word, uh, and then you don't feed that word back to the input, the system could produce another word that has that is inconsistent with the previous one you you so produced. That information not be encoded in the hidden state that is traveling between the two time sets. It should, but it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not not well enough that that it works. So so this so this kind of sequential production is pretty much required. In principle, you're right. It's not very satisfying. Um, so there's a problem with this, which is that the entire meaning of the sentence has to be kind of squeezed into that hidden state that is between the encoder and the decoder. Um, that's one problem. The second problem is that despite the fact that LSTM are built to preserve information, uh, they are basically memory cells, they don't actually preserve information for more than about 20 words. So if your sentence is more than 20 words, by the time you get to the end of the sentence, your, your hidden state will have forgotten the beginning of it. So what people use for this, the, the fix for this is a, a huge hack. It's called buy LSTM. And it's a completely trivial idea that consists in running two LSTMs in opposite directions. Okay? And then you get two codes. One that is uh, running an LSTM from beginning to end of the sentence. That's one vector. And then the second vector is from running an LSTM in the other direction. You get a second vector. That's the meaning of your sentence. You can basically double the length, length of your sentence without losing too much information this way. But it's not a very satisfying solution. So if you see by STM, that's what, that's what it is. Um, so as I said, the success was short-lived because, uh, in fact, before the paper was published at NIPS, uh, there was a paper by uh, 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 Dimitri Badanao, uh, Kyung Yung Cho, and Yosho Benjo, uh, which was published on Archive in uh, September 14, that said um, we can use attention. So the attention mechanism I mentioned earlier, uh, instead of having those gigantic uh, networks and squeezing the entire meaning of a sentence into this small vector, it would make more sense to do translation if at every time step, you know, when we want to produce a word in French corresponding to a sentence in English, if we looked at the location in the English sentence that had that word, okay? So our decoder is going to produce French words one at a time, and when it comes to produce a word uh, that has an equivalent in the input English sentence, it's going to focus its attention on that word, and then the translation from French to English of that word would be simple, or the you know, it, could, it may not be a single word, it could be a group of words, right? Because very often you have to turn a group of words in English into a group of words in French to kind of say the same thing. If it's German, you have to uh, put the, you know, the verb at the end of the sentence, whereas in English it might be at the beginning. So basically you use this, this attention mechanism. So this attention module here is the one that I showed uh, a couple of slides earlier, which basically decides uh, which of the time steps, which of the hidden representation for which of the word in the input sentence is going to focus on uh, to kind of produce a representation that is going to produce the current word at a particular time step. So here we're at time step number three, we're going to produce the third word, uh, and we're going to have to decide which of the input word corresponds to this, and we're going to have this uh, attention mechanism. So essentially we're going to have a a, a small piece of neural net that's going to look at the, at the inputs and decide on 
is going to have an output which is going to go through a softmax and is going to produce a bunch of coefficients that sum to one that are between zero and one, and they're going to compute a linear combination of the states at different time steps. Okay, by setting one of those coefficients to one and the other ones to zero, it's going to focus the attention of the, of the system on one particular word. So the magic of this is that this neural net that decides that runs through the softmax and decides on those uh, coefficients actually can be trained with backprop. It's just another set of weights in a neural net, and you don't have to build this by hand. It just figures it out. Uh, this completely revolutionized the field of neural machine translation in the sense that within uh, a few months, a team from Stanford won a big uh, competition with this, beating all the other methods. Um, and then within three months, every big company that works on translation had basically deployed systems based on this. So this just changed everything. And then people started paying attention to attention. <laughs> okay, Paying more attention to attention. In a sense that, uh, and then there was a, a paper by uh, a bunch of people at Google uh, where the title was Attention is All You Need, and it was basically a paper that solved a bunch of natural language processing tasks by using a neural net where every layer and every group of neurons basically was implement, implementing attention and that, that's what a, uh, or something called self-attention, that's what a transformer is. Yes. You can have a variable number of outputs, of, of inputs that you focus attention on. Okay, I'm going to talk now about memory networks. Uh, so this stems from uh, work at Facebook that was started by uh, Antoine Borde, I think in 2014, and uh, uh, by uh, uh, Sana Sukhbatar. I think in 2015 or 16, uh, called end-to-end -end memory networks. Uh, Sana Sukhbatar is, uh, was a PhD student here and he was an intern at, uh, at Facebook when he worked on this, uh, together with a bunch of other people at Facebook. And the idea of a memory network is that you'd like to have a short-term memory. You'd like your neural net to have a short-term memory, a working memory, okay? Uh, you'd like it to, you know, you, you tell, okay, if I tell you a story, I tell you, uh, uh, John goes to the kitchen, uh, John picks up the milk, um, uh, Jane goes to the kitchen, uh, and then John goes to the bedroom and drops the milk there, and then goes back to the kitchen, and I ask you, where's the milk? Okay, so every time I, I told you a sentence, you kind of updated in your mind a, a kind of current state of the world, if you want. And so by telling you the story, now you have a representation of the state of the world, and if I ask you a question about the state of the world, you can answer it. Okay? You store this in a short-term memory. Uh, you didn't store it, okay, so there's, kind of this, there's a number of different parts in your brain, but there's two important parts. One is the cortex. The cortex is where you have long-term memory, where you, uh, you know, you, you, um, where all your, your thinking is, is done and all that stuff. And there is a separate, uh, uh, you know, chunk of neurons called the hippocampus, which is sort of, it's kind of two formations in the middle of the brain, and they kind of send uh, wires to pretty much everywhere in the cortex. And the hippocampus is thought that to, to be used as a short-term memory. So it can just, you know, remember things for a relatively short time. Uh, the prevalent uh, theory is that when you, when you sleep, and you dream, there is a lot of information that is being transferred from your hippocampus to your cortex to be solidified in long-term memory. Um, because the hippocampus has limited capacity. Uh, when you get senile, like you get really old, very often your hippocampus shrinks and you don't have sh short-term memory anymore, so you keep repeating the same stories to the same people. Okay? It's very common. Um, <clears throat> Or you go to a room to do something, and by the time you get to the room, you forgot what you were there for. Uh, this starts happening by the time you're 50, by the way. <laughs> 
Um, <clears throat> so I don't remember what I said last last week, uh, two weeks ago. Um, okay, but anyway, so memory network. Uh, here is the idea of memory network. You you have an input to the memory network. Let's call it X, and think of it as an address of a memory. Okay. What you're going to do is you're going to compare this X with uh, a bunch of vectors we're going to call K. So K1, K2, K3. Okay, so you, you compare those two vectors. And the way you compare them is through a dot product. Very simple. Okay, so now you have the three dot products of all the, the three Ks with the X. Those are scalar values. You plug them through a softmax. So what you get are three numbers between 0 and 1 that sum to 1. What do you do with those? You have three other vectors that I'm going to call V, V1, V2, V3. And what you do is you multiply these vectors by those scalars. So this is very much like the attention mechanism that we just talked about. Okay? And you sum them up. Okay? So take an X, compare X with each of the K, each of the Ks, those are called keys. You get a bunch of coefficients between 0 and 1 that sum to 1, and then compute a linear combination of the values, those are value vectors. Um, and sum them up. Okay? So imagine that one of the key exactly matches X. You're going to have a large coefficient here and small coefficients there. So the output of the system will essentially be V2. If K2 matches X, the output will essentially be V2. Okay? So this is a, an addressable associative memory. Okay? Associative memory is exactly that, right? You have keys and values, and if your input matches a key, you get the value. Here it's a kind of a soft differentiable version of that. Um, so you can uh, you can back propagate through this. You can you can write into this memory by changing the v vectors, or even changing the k vectors. You can change the v vectors by gradient descent. Okay, so if you wanted the output of your memory to be something in particular, by back propagating gradient through this. Uh, you're going to change the currently active V to whatever it needs for the, for the output. So in those papers, uh, what, uh, what they did was, um, I mean, there's a series of papers on memory network, but um, what they did was exactly the scenario I just explained where you, you kind of tell a story to a system. So give it a sequence of sentences. Those sentences are encoded into vectors by running through a neural net, which is not pre-trained. It, you know, um, it just through the training of the entire system, it figures out how to encode this, uh, and then those sentences are, are written to the memory of this type. And then, when you ask a question to the system, you encode the question at the input of a neural net. The neural net produces an X to the memory. The memory returns uh, a value. Uh, and then you use this value uh, and the previous state of the network to kind of re-access the memory. You can do this multiple times. And you train this entire network to produce the right answer to your, to your question. Um, and if you have lots and lots of scenarios, lots and lots of questions, lots of, lots of answers, which they did uh, in this case with, uh, by artificially generating stories, questions, and answers, uh, this thing actually learns to store stories and answer questions. Uh, which is pretty amazing. So that's the memory network. Professor, what, can you just say one more time what happens in the first step? Okay, so the first step is you compute uh, 
alpha i equals uh, k i transpose x. Okay, just a dot product. Okay, and then you compute um, c i or the vector c, I should say. is the softmax function applied to the vector of alphas. Okay, so the c's are between 0 and 1 and some 2, 1. And then the output of the system is uh, sum over i of ci vi, where vi has, are the value vectors. Okay, that's the memory. Huh? Yes. Is it possible to use memory yeah. networks for something like visual question answering? Yes. Also have a visual component? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Will we require two separate memory networks? Not really. No, I mean, all you need is everything to be encoded as vectors. Right? And so run through your favorite ConvNet, you get a vector that represents the image, and then you can do VQA. Um, yeah, I mean, so... You can imagine lots of applications of this. So uh, in particular, uh, when application is, um, I mean, you can, you can think of, uh, you know, think of this as a kind of a, a memory. And then you can have some sort of neural net that, you know, takes, a, takes an input and then produces an address for the memory, gets a value back, and then keeps going, and eventually produces an output. This looks very much like a computer, <laughs> okay? Where the neural net here is the the CPU, the ALU, the CPU, okay? And the the memory is just an external memory you can access whenever you need it, or you can write to it if you want. It's a recurrent net in this case. You can unfold it in time, which is what these guys did. Um, and, and then, so then there are people who kind of uh, imagine that you could actually build kind of differentiable computers out of this. So there's something called a neural Turing machine, which is essentially a form of this where the memory is not of this type. It's kind of a soft tape, like in, in a regular Turing machine. Uh, this is uh, some work from DeepMind that, uh, there's an interesting story about this, which is that the Facebook people put out uh, the, the paper on the memory network on archive. And three days later, uh, the DeepMind people put out a paper uh, about neural Turing machine. And the reason they put it three days later is that they've been working on neural Turing machine, and in their tradition, they kind of keep project secret unless, you know, until they can make a big splash. But then they got scooped, so they put the paper out on archive. Um, eventually, they made a big splash with, another, with a paper, but um, that was a year later or so. Uh, so what's happened um, since then is that people have kind of taken this module, this idea that you compare inputs to keys, and that gives you coefficients, and you know you 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 produce values as kind of an essential module in a in a neural net, and that's basically what a transformer is. So a transformer is basically a neural net in which uh, every group of neurons is one of those. It's a, it's a whole bunch of memories, essentially. There's some more twist to it, okay. But that's kind of the basic, uh, the basic idea. But you'll hear about this in a week. Oh, in two weeks. Oh, wait, one week, yeah. One week, one week. Okay, any more questions? Cool. All right. Thank you very much.